Getting my patients off inappropriate medications is one of the most important but difficult tasks at the clinic. So here's the step-by-step approach that I follow, which has recently changed because of a new clinical trial. But first though, some sobering statistics. So over 40% of adults over the age of 75 are prescribed five or more medications. And as I explained to my patients, while those medications may have given you a benefit when you were younger, as we get older, the risks from those medications, they start to outweigh the benefits and they turn into poison. So in one study of nursing home residents, for example, efforts to reduce unnecessary prescriptions slash mortality risks by an impressive 26% and fall risks by 24%. But this raises a whole host of questions. When does it make sense to stop medications? Which medication should be stopped? And how can we get this process right? So let's take a closer look. And if someone you love is taking multiple medications, consider sharing this video with them. Now, I want to walk you through two recent patient examples from the clinic. So these will help you see how we approach this medication deprescribing process in concrete terms. And I've chosen cases with common issues so that I can highlight some general lessons that apply to many of the patients that I see. So the first patient was new to my practice. He was in his early 80s and he exercised regularly. So his key health metrics were very good, so his blood pressure was 126 on 84, and his LDL cholesterol was 54 milligrams per deciliter. So here's the list of medications that he was currently taking. So he was on candesartan, aspirin, omeprazole, uh, pravastatin, and azetamibe. So that's five medications in total. Now with new patients like this, we always need to think carefully through each medication to determine if it's actually necessary. So here's how we work through that list. So first, I noticed that we can separate these medications into two categories. So omeprazole is a treatment for acid reflux, and the rest are related to risk factors for heart disease. So if we start with omeprazole, I asked the patient about his reflux symptoms, and it turns out that he hadn't had any symptoms for years. And just two years prior, he had had a scope of his throat and stomach that showed that everything looked normal. So there was no evidence of damage from stomach acid. So we reduced the omeprazole from 40 milligrams to 20 milligrams, and the goal is to reduce that again in three months' time to about 10 milligrams, and then ideally try and stop the medication completely. Now with each medication step, we'll be looking to make sure that there's no adverse effects, such as in this case, no reflux that's come back. And we don't want to stop omeprazole all at once because it can cause rebound reflux. The body does need some time to adjust. Now, what about the other medications? Now, I told this patient that there's no need to be on aspirin. So we've known about the beneficial effects of aspirin in relation to heart disease for decades. But for those who haven't been diagnosed with heart disease, and it's important to note that because the guidelines are different between people who've had a heart attack and those who haven't, Taking aspirin was associated with an 11% lower risk of things like heart attacks and strokes. So that data comes from a meta-analysis that included 13 trials and over 160,000 participants. But we've now come to a deeper understanding about the potential risks with aspirin. So since aspirin can help prevent the formation of blood clots, it can make sense that it can also generate problems with bleeding. The bleeding often occurs in the digestive tract, but it can also occur in the brain. So that same meta-analysis found that aspirin use was associated with a 43% higher risk of major bleeding. So the absolute risks here are low, but they do increase with age. And there are additional risks of anemia and with iron deficiency, which are more pronounced in older adults. So due to only a modest potential benefit and significant risks that come with age, the clinical guidelines actually suggest that the risks with aspirin outweigh the benefits for those who haven't already had a heart attack or a stroke before. Now, there can be exceptions in very specific cases. So this can include patients that have got high LP little a or extensive calcium buildup in a patient's blood vessels or a very high heart disease risk. But none of those factors applied here. So together, my patient and I decided to stop taking the aspirin. And that can also decrease the need for taking omeprazole as well. So we can see here that the changes uh, in one area can also affect others. So that left three medications. So the candesartan for blood pressure and pravastatin and azetamibe for cholesterol. And keeping those metrics within the optimal ranges is a high priority. Now, since this patient was fit and well and wasn't having any noticeable side effects from these medications, we decided to continue them. So let's pause here for some general lessons. So two of the medications that we've looked at, so aspirin and omeprazole, I see all of the time with my older patients at the clinic. And just like with this patient, there's often no reason to be on omeprazole. And many of these patients are still on aspirin because it was prescribed decades ago and it's just been continually repeated. So let's switch gears and have a look at a second patient. So patient number two was also a new patient to the clinic. So she was in her late 60s, but she was using a walker. She was quite frail and she was at a high risk of falls. So her blood pressure was fine at 128 on 80, but her levels of sodium in her blood, however, were quite low at 130. And she was on the following medications. She was on amitriptyline and zopiclone at night, both to help with her sleep. She was on candesartan, bendroflumethazide, and sertraline. 
Now, as with the first patient that we looked at, it's useful to break down these medications into categories. So two of the medications relate to her blood pressure, and the other three address sleep issues and depression. So a key issue here with patients like this is a, is a high fall risk. So falls are a big problem among older adults. These injuries can drive losses of mobility and independence, and partly that's a consequence of getting older and the frailty that comes with it. But the medications here can also substantially boost risks. So in fact, there are categories of drugs known as fall-increasing risk drugs that clinicians know to watch out for. So these medications can contribute to falls in several ways. So sometimes they're sedatives, so they slow down the nervous system, which makes us drowsy and can affect balance, coordination, and reaction time. These drugs can also cause muscle weakness, and they can cause blood pressure that goes too low. They can also cause mental symptoms like brain fog. So with this patient, all five of these medications that she was on, unfortunately, are classified as fall-increasing risk drugs. So here's how we work through them. So let's start with the medications related to her sleep issues and depression. So Zopiclone is used to treat insomnia. So you can imagine that a frail older lady getting up to pee at night, if she's got sedatives on board, that's a recipe for disaster. She's going to fall. So we plan to slowly wean her off this medication completely. But what about the sleep issues? Because we can't just leave her with um, debilitating sleep problems. So here, we could consider adding a low-dose sustained-release melatonin. So in a meta-analysis of 14 studies, melatonin was shown to reduce the time it took to fall asleep. And there was a separate review showing improved sleep quality. We also talked about the importance of sleep hygiene, so creating the ideal conditions that promote greater sleep that don't involve medications. So here in my clinic, we've got a health improvement practitioner that the patient can work with, and this is completely free of charge, to optimize their sleep, again, without medications. Now, once the patient is off Zopiclone, then we'd aim to start to reduce and ideally stop the amitriptyline, which is an antidepressant, but it's sometimes used to help patients fall asleep. Uh, the patient was also using sertraline for depression, but it's when it's combined with her two other blood pressure medications that this can cause significant concerns. It's because this combination of these three medications is likely what's driving her low sodium levels in her blood. So low sodium isn't something that we often hear much about. The concern generally is the opposite, where high levels of sodium intake drive our blood pressure. So what's the issue here with low sodium or hyponatremia? Well, for one, research has shown that even mild hyponatremia significantly increases the risks of falls. So one analysis of over 16,000 elderly patients admitted to hospital found a 42% higher risk with sodium levels of between 30 to 134. So that's mild hyponatremia. There's also evidence that hyponatremia increases mortality. So for instance, researchers looked at elderly patients who'd had a fall or a fracture. Having hyponatremia was associated with a more than double the risk of mortality while in hospital recovering from the injuries. So we stopped the bendroflumethazide for my patient. Uh, bendroflumethazide is a diuretic, and its primary use is to reduce blood pressure. But because of its diuretic effect, it can drop the sodium substantially. And out of the three medications that my patient was on that affect the sodium levels, bendroflumethazide has probably the largest effect on sodium. But stopping the bendroflumethazide means that the blood pressure could rise substantially without it. Yet here's the recent study that has changed our thinking around this, and it provides some interesting context that made this decision a bit easier. So the study was an examination of the impact of reducing the number of drugs that frail elderly patients take for high blood pressure. So the researchers found that reducing the number of medications actually didn't seem to increase overall mortality, which is what we would have expected, because again, if we're removing these medications, the blood pressure is going to go higher, and a higher blood pressure generally increases our risks of heart attacks and strokes. And for my patient sitting in front of me, even if the blood pressure did rise, again, this patient is quite old and frail, so we can accept a level up until about 140. If the blood pressure went above 140, I could consider adding a low-dose calcium channel blocker, so that a uh, class of medication doesn't have nearly the effect on sodium levels compared to the bendroflumethazide. And if we did need further blood pressure lowering, we could also add a low-dose beta blocker. It's preferable if necessary to have several blood pressure medications at low doses rather than just one medication at a super high dose because hitting the blood pressure on multiple different pathways, we can overall get a greater blood pressure lowering effect with less chance of side effects. And again, we'd want to select medications that don't have as much of an impact on sodium levels. We also planned to reduce the sertraline from 100 milligrams to 50 milligrams. But ideally, we don't want to leave mental health issues unaddressed. So here, a key priority is to ensure the patient is connected to her community. So what are some general lessons here? 
It's very common for older patients to be on medications that increase their fall risk. So in this case, it was amitriptyline and zopiclone, as well as the combination of her blood pressure medications. It's also common to see blood pressure medications and antidepressant medications that cause hyponatremia, especially in frail patients. In both of these cases, we're often at a place where the benefits of these medications, they're outweighed by the risks and they've turned into poison. But we have to be sensitive to the changes that we observe. So for instance, I mentioned that I'd be okay with a blood pressure of about 140 in this frail patient um, before we need to add on additional medications. Again, because we don't want it to be too high because then we're escalating other risks like heart attacks and strokes. It's always a balancing act. But you might be wondering at this point, okay, what's the takeaway here for you? If you're wondering about your own medications or you're wondering about the medications uh, of someone that you love, where do you go from here? Well, it's important to emphasize that ideally, you want to work through a decision-making process with your doctor because it does involve several important steps. So I'm going to quickly describe them so that you know how best to cooperate with your doctor to arrive at decisions that make the most sense for your health or the health for someone that you care about. And while anyone taking multiple medications might benefit by going through this process, there are a couple of cases that are particularly at risk from unnecessary or inappropriate medications. So for example, if patients have multiple health problems or they've been through several care transitions uh, with different people writing prescriptions, if they've got a limited life expectancy or if they struggle to take their medications as directed, if they're older, if they're frail or if they've got dementia. And there are certain classes of medications that are flagged for potential problems by groups like the American Geriatric Society. So we've seen a few of those examples already in this video. So if a conversation about deprescribing makes sense, here's the process that I work through with my patients. So it's got three simple phases. So the first one is that we gather information. So what is this patient currently taking? And are there any problematic adverse effects? And what is the patient's health status and goals? The next is that we identify medications that might be appropriate to stop taking. So it's a shared decision-making process. It's not my job to tell patients what to do. Instead, it's my job as a physician to educate patients about the potential benefits and harms that are associated with things like whether there's a current condition calling for treatment. And if the patient then takes this information and weighs it in the light of their uh, priorities and goals and risk tolerance, then they may elect to stop taking the medication. And after that conversation, the third phase is to create and implement a concrete plan. So together we'll decide which medications to stop or reduce and how we're going to go about it. And proper follow-up here is essential uh, to get right. Now, the body doesn't always react as we expected, uh, so we always need to be ready to make adjustments as necessary. Now, let's just take a look at one final case to illustrate the clinical decision-making process, because it includes one more common issue that I often see with my older patients. So this patient is in his mid-70s, and he's got type 2 diabetes and heart failure. His HbA1c, which is a measure of blood sugar levels, was 6.7%. So he was taking Lantus 50 units, glucoside, aspirin, and a beta blocker. So here's what I discuss with my patients. The first is that I recommended that he stop taking aspirin. There was no history of heart attacks, and in this case, the risks of bleeding that we talked about earlier in the video, they outweigh the modest potential benefit. The second is that I explained to him that there's an important trade-off between blood sugar control and other risks. So the HbA1c level of 6.7%, that's quite aggressive for a type 2 diabetic, and it needs to be... Um, we need to balance out the risks versus benefit, particularly as patients get older. So the clinical guidelines suggest a more lenient target of 8% uh, in frail older individuals with multiple health problems. And the reason being is that if we're too aggressive in controlling blood sugar, we can actually cause significant risks in the opposite direction. So blood pressure, it can drop too low, and the risk here is substantially higher in older adults. Uh, and one of the key dangers here, again, is falling. So I recommended to cut the lantus, which is a form of insulin, in half. I also recommended to stop the glycoside. So that's another medication uh, to control blood sugar. And how it works is that it tells the pancreas to create more insulin. So again, that uh, type of medication does have, have the potential uh, of lowering blood sugar levels too much. Now, at the same time, I suggested to him uh, that he should start taking empagliflozin, uh, 10 milligrams. So that's an SGLT2 inhibitor, which is a medication strongly indicated for patients with type 2 diabetes and heart failure. Now, finally, what about the beta blocker? So this is important in the management of heart failure, but it does have problematic interactions with insulin-lowering drugs. So there's an additional reason to cut the insulin and stop the glycoside. Now, two things to notice here in this final case. The first is that with frail older adults, 
We don't want to try and control the blood sugar levels too tightly. If we push for targets that might be appropriate for younger adults, it can start to generate concerns for things like falls in the older population. And the second is that our focus here has been on stopping medications, but sometimes it does make sense to add additional medication so long as there's a very good reason. So in this case, for instance, an SGLT2 inhibitor is indicated to significantly reduce the risks related to heart failure. Now, in two of the case studies that we've looked at, frailty has been an issue. So this is very common with aging, but there are some important steps that we can take, particularly as we cross midlife, and they can make an enormous difference in maintaining mobility when we get older. So make sure to check out this next video here to learn more about a crucial type of exercise that many of us are missing.